All right. Everything Welcome everyone go. to our panel about preserving sound in computers and consoles. My name is Chris. I run a YouTube channel called Displaced Gamers. And joining me today, we have YouTubers Corey and Try from My Life and Gaming. Hi. As well as, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this right, man. Creator <laughs> of the 240p test suite, the Imagineer behind the MD Fourier project and the godfather of awesomeness, Artemio. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was too much, Chris. Thank you. So, it's it's never too much when it comes to our team, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's, so, it's well, thank you for joining like, me, guys. Um, so when I talk about preserving sound, this is a topic that I don't feel people really ever talk about. When I talk about preserving sound, what what do I mean? Why is it important for us to preserve the sounds of these old video games that that people play just for fun and then you know, move on with their lives. Why do we need to do something about preserving sound? Well, I think that uh, uh, the, the main question would be, why would we need to preserve games? And from there, uh, why wouldn't we need to preserve a part of those games with a more precision? Uh, and I'd say that first and foremost, they are important artifacts for people out there and they are cultural uh, artifacts that represent a part of our history and they also uh, can be very valuable resources in the future for investigations that you can't even imagine for example if you have an arcade pcb and you reach out to it you can figure out if i don't know capcom and snk were working together at that time if they had relationships with philippines or with thailand to build <laughs> those components if there was an economical uh, or a political reason for that happening that could sustain that evidence and that's that's just from the hardware itself and uh, there's so much culture around every one of these objects and sound is uh, at least half of the experience when you when you're in front of a game uh, playing it, right? Uh, so why not t not pay more attention to that? That that would be my question. Yeah, and it seems to me that sound has been harder to get right in emulated form than simply replicating the visuals in a way where, you know, there aren't obvious visual glitches and things like that. I mean, there are certain platforms that, you know, like Sega Genesis and PC Engine that in particular are kind of infamous for, for whatever reason, the, the information of how the, the console works, which mm -hmm. I don't know a lot about, but the information of that is not translated quite as clean into emulation oftentimes, I think. Yeah. Uh, I feel that... Oh, go ahead, Corey. Uh, I mean, and a lot of people will say that the audio is more subjective. You know, I like there's a lot of audio files will say mm -hmm. audio is more subjective. Uh, and, you know, it changes from person to person. But until recently, we it was very difficult to really nail down a way to get hard, actual hard data on audio. I think that uh, first and foremost, the, the the issue is that you can see the discrete colors on screen and uh, judge them with a, I don't know, a capture card. Mm -hmm. But yes, it may be an issue to get that properly calibrated and you're getting the levels right. There's, there's a kind of worms there, yes. But you can kind of, at least relatively between themselves, check out each pixel and check the colors that you're getting, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, that's a, an, a huge issue because it's analog video and that, that won't translate as easily. But I'm simplifying here. I'm just saying how it works uh, as exposed to the user. You can see or you can tell that the colors and the pixels are on screen. And it's self-evident because there are discrete elements that are uh, split by the image itself. And uh, when you're talking about audio... It's uh, rarely a single tone that you're hearing. You are hearing a composition between uh, the sum of a lot of sounds, sound effects, the music, and uh, many of them could be played back directly like samples or others could be produced uh, live. And that makes it uh, difficult, I think. Visually, we can put two things next to each other and someone can, can judge, say, which one they like better. You can do that with sound to a certain extent, but sometimes people are 
unaware mm -hmm. that there's a difference. They don't notice it. Or maybe they notice it on a subconscious level, right? Yeah. So it, it's one of those things where if you're playing a game and the sound is muted, you might say, well, where's the sound? And as soon as somebody gives you the sound, you're, you just say, well, okay, and you move on with it. Mm -hmm. Yet, if you take the same person and you were to have them play the same game with two different types of sound hardware, it could very well be that they said, oh, I appreciated the first way I played the game versus the second way I played the game. And it could be that the only variable there was the sound, and they're unaware of it because it's awesome. reached them on a bit of a subconscious level. Mm -hmm. Supporting what you just said, Chris, I was just last night playing Is 9, and, and uh, I have been playing it with the volume lower during the last week. And when I played with the volume higher, it affected how I experienced it. And, mm -hmm. and it's a very common and well-known uh, situation that uh, volume or amplitude affects our perception of uh, what, which we, we, we prefer, right? Yeah, especially in a series like Ease, where the music is, <laughs> is integral to the experience. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I, I knew people back in the day, and I'm sure there's still a lot of people that that are like this now, um, where you know they would either turn the game volume all the way down or turn the music all the way down if they had that option, and they would like you know have a, another TV next to them where they were like watching something on TV while they were <laughs> playing the game. The the audio to the game was not that important to them, right. although. I kind of wonder if they had had the audio on, maybe it would be more meaningful to their experience with the game than they think it would be. But I think for a lot of people, uh, not people in this community, certainly, but I think a lot of people who, um, who, for who it's maybe a little bit more of a disposable entertainment, mm -hmm. uh, don't think about game audio period. If they even listen to it at all. On that same line, uh, maybe in many cases it's because one wants to, to get immersed or absorbed by ex the experience and audio helps in that regard, right? If you're not Absolutely. looking for that, if you're just looking to pass time, it, it's less important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And one thing I've become acutely aware of over time is that as I, as I get older, there's less, I hear less, like, less frequencies in the music <laughs> or in sound. You know, I've been called out on that several times with... Uh, you know, if if I shoot something and I have a CRT on in the background, I can't hear it. And then uh, oh. people are saying like, "Oh, what's that sound?" Every time you're on camera, I can hear this ringing in the sound. So now I have to use like a notch. I have to use like a um, a notch filter so I could like you know take that specific frequency and just push it push it out. Um, but but you know, speaking of the you know sort of the the limits of your own perception. Uh, I think in regard to audio preservation and just preservation in general, I think it's important to sort of separate uh, what you perceive from what is actually there. Because I, for example, am profoundly musically inept. You know, if you, it, it blew me away back in the day when, you know, if, if y'all are familiar with uh, the Final Fantasy games, especially the earlier Final Fantasy games like on NES and Super Nintendo, and I apologize, I cannot sing, uh, but there, at the beginning of the battle theme in all of those games, it goes, dun na 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 dun na dun na 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 dun na And a friend uh, went on piano and went one note six times, dun na 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 and then two notes lower, Donna, and then repeated that. Blew my mind that that <laughs> battle intro was two notes. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, th those, th that whole first set of six notes could have been anywhere in my mind. I Like, I can hear it, I can recognize the tune, but I just have a very difficult time understanding, uh, you know, just the flow of music. I can't read music. I, you know, I, I, I'm very musically inept, but, uh, no matter what you perceive, I think getting to the, you know, the, the truth of what, uh, that music is, what that hardware is doing. It's, it's important to do that uh, on, in a similar way to where someone might plug their PlayStation two into their HD TV and say, well, th th there's zero lag here. 
And it's like, well, buddy, I'm sorry to tell you, but that game is 480i. You're on an HDTV. There is 100% for sure some degree of lag. You may not feel it, but you don't need to go on the internet telling people, oh, it, it, it you know, th- there is no lag or, you know, uh, this emulated version of something is exactly the same as the original. It's exactly the same. You know, people really like to use a lot of definitives based on their own perception and then spread that around. And we need to step back and be a little bit skeptical of what we are perceiving and use what tools we have to do things like detect input lag, detect uh, color anomalies, and detect audio anomalies. It's important what you're mentioning because it it, uh, helps either way. Sometimes when you measure it and you say, I'm very sensitive to lag, and you measure it, and then you notice, no, I'm not. It, it's a possibility. I'm not saying that that's mm-hmm. a case, right? But I, I'm very sensitive to colors, and, and, and you measure it, and you notice, no, I'm not, just like you said with those mm-hmm. notes. And the same could happen with audio, or it could be the other way. Once you train yourself, you notice that you start uh, uh, figuring out which things are off, if you understand them, if you put names into them. It's like the colors, right? You, you've all heard probably that... Uh, colors only exist in the cultures when we name them. Mm-hmm. I, I believe that's mm. uh, really true in, in many ways because until you understand that's a bass line, that's a guitar, that those are high frequencies, these are high, uh, low frequencies, these are the mids, and you start like playing uh, with a digital audio uh, uh, editor and remove or filter out each one and separate them or just like taping over your tweeters or, or <laughs> your cones and trying to understand how things are separated and you name them, you can start understanding them. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of an aside, but that reminded me about how I like recently learned that in in Japanese, like there's kind of an overlap of what they consider like blue and green. Like if you had a, uh, you know, an unripe banana, they'd look at it and be like, oh, it's this kind of blue. Or like the traffic light would be like, oh, it's, you know, it's a blue light. <laughs> and you can flip it and it, it could be that we are missing that experience. Yeah. yeah. So I want to talk about the Super Nintendo real quick because there's been a, a recent uh, push to have these remastered soundtracks where yes. people are going mm. back to some of the original equipment and grabbing these sounds that have not been through the compression that you would hear them have if when they're played back on a real super nintendo what do you what do you guys think about that uh i think it loses a lot of the texture of to the to the music and uh it's it's pretty neat but i would not want it that way permanently yeah it loses a lot of personality to it yeah i mean and of course we say that as people who grew up playing super nintendo you know we we Mm -hmm. we are attached to how it sounds. And, you know, I, I, I could imagine, you know, maybe someone who, uh, you know, is high school age today, if they were, you know, given a side by side of those, they would say, which do you prefer? And they'd say, Oh, well, you know, this remastered version sounds cleaner. Yeah. Um, they might prefer it, but it is, it is inauthentic right. to what that actual experience is. And I think it's important to remember that, uh, I, I I doubt very few, if any, of the people who were composing for Super Nintendo games were thinking, oh, if only my masterpiece could sound exactly like this raw sample. No, they chose the sample because that sample sounded good coming out of the Super Nintendo. That sounds a lot, Not- sounds a lot like somebody saying that, you know, they used composite <laughs> to create their uh, their images. Well, and Everything. which is which is true. I mean, you know, I, I it, it is very obvious on the Sega Genesis that uh, some artists did use mm-hmm. composite video characteristics cleverly. But like I always say, like I always say, I think anyone who worked on these old games, I, I have such a hard time believing that very many of them are such stuck up artists that if you were not playing it on a CRT in composite or RF video, uh, they would be like, uh, mm, mm, this is really not, that's, uh, that's not, not really how you should be playing it. No, it doesn't look right. Does it sound right? Mm-mm, mm-mm. No, like 20, 30, 40 years after they made the darn thing, like 
if if there's like people out there that still want to play it or listen to it or look at it, like th- they would be nothing more than grateful, just totally mm-hmm. grateful that you were experiencing their work so much la- so much time after they made it. Right. There's also the the thing that we we can look at the past and think that that's like antiquated or obsolete, but it was uh, top of the line at the moment, right? Right. And uh, I bet that if they had uh, RGB as an option, they would probably tune their their things up there. And also with the samples taking it back, if they had more RAM on the SNES or more cartridge space, because that would have raised costs everywhere. Uh, they would have chose to do that. I think that it's um, it's interesting to to listen to them on the the sources, mm-hmm. but uh, they are certainly a different character. Just like like Corey said, what do you think, Chris? <laughs> well, I was actually I got a little distracted because Tri mentioned the Sega Genesis, mm-hmm. and I started thinking about how. Well, thankfully, we only have one model of the Sega Genesis, right? And they all, have the same, <laughs> right? I mean, there's no other way. No, we have many models of the Sega Genesis and other devices that play Sega Genesis games. So, what do we preserve? Which one's the right one? You talk about sound being subjective, right? I mean, not only do you have these different revisions of the console and the circuits for their output, but you literally have a change in Yamaha chips at some point. <laughs> right. So then, you know, some people are going to get into, well, this composer used the this sound chip, this composer used that sound chip, and they may select it based on that. Right. Artemio is holding up the definitive, oh, <laughs> that's your childhood Genesis, the Model 1, right? Yeah, which is which is the now the definitive Sega Genesis of all time <laughs> <laughs> in, in this in moment. This, yeah, yeah, certified. <laughs> so I, I suppose we should take this opportunity to uh, explain that the the work that Artemia is doing uh, is in a, uh, a utility or application called MD Fourier. Do you want to kind of explain to people in the in the chat like? What exactly it is? Because you're, I'm sure you're very good at just like summing it up very quick, quickly at this point. Oh, well, basically, it's just a tool to try and help with an issue. Just as Try was saying, uh, it's very difficult to evaluate sound just uh, at face value, right? Mm-hmm. So the idea is uh, to split the every part of the of the sound produced on a game system console or, or system in general, and make that run. Uh, series of tones to cover everything that it can reproduce and we can hear, okay? It could be expanded either way, but that way you could just measure how it responds, how it, it uh, behaves when it plays back those sounds from the whole spectrum, everything that, that could be produced and we can hear, and uh, then just measure it back uh, with math uh, called a Fourier transform uh, to compare between things. And it, it comes back to what Chris was saying uh, about references, because uh, the software is made the, in a way that you can choose any reference and any uh, or, or target and any other source to compare them. And it gives you uh, the as output, the difference visually uh, on how they differ in the spectrum that you select. So how did you discover how to like do this? I mean, uh, Fourier is. I mean, he was a uh, was he a composer or a sound analyst? Like, I mean, he was a person, correct? Yeah. Well, th- this guy was a genius, and he two hundred years ago basically used or invented the the process. Mm-hmm. Although other people had had already uh, kind of uh, played with it, but a way to decompose a signal. A signal is anything that you can uh, record by measurements, okay? So mm-hmm. so he was measuring temperature, and he was trying to figure out how temperature changed in, 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 in his setup for something, okay? And he developed this process to decompose the, a signal and how it behaves into uh, its most essential uh, parts. That is, we were talking about 
uh, sound that you you get a sum of the things. Everything, my voice right now, what you're hearing, is uh, is being played back by by my mouth and uh, my fringe and everything, and it goes into this microphone. This microphone vibrates in the same way uh, that the air my voice is pushing, is pushing, it converts it to an electrical signal. The electrical signal vibrates in an analog way to what I'm saying. And that is being digitized, right? It's being sampled. But my voice is not a single tone. It's not vibrating in a, in a sine wave that could be just like math, purely my, my, mathematical. It's a sum of how every, every one of my vocal cords, my teeth, my tongue, Every, every vibration there is summed up. What the Fourier transform does is take that complex waveform and convert it into basic sine waves that could be uh, represented with mathematical form formulas. And uh, how that helps is because if you simplify things that way, you can make take out the ones that are not needed, for example, and not needed, I'm saying, if it's composed by, I'll, I'll just throw a number, 5,000 waves, I take the top five, compress those and send them over the internet. And that's what you're hearing right now. I'm oversimplifying, but that's kind of what the Fourier transform is used for right now, for the video you're watching, the audio that we, you're listening to right now. So that process is, uh, is what uh, I, I simply took and, uh, and said, well, if, if, if we want to compare audio and want to have uh, an objective way to compare how a particular note is being played by one console and another console, we can just decompose them into their essential notes and compare those. And if those add up, then we have the same thing. If those are different, then we have different things. That's kind of the basic idea. I hope I didn't <laughs> go <laughs> too much. So, so basically, you know, you, you take that, sound data from uh from you know a, a reference console like artemio's childhood sega genesis model one and but the reference is arbitrary yeah yes the reference is arbitrary yes but you if you you take uh you know something like for example you know it could be anything from an at games clone to uh, a real Model 2 Sega Genesis to a Mega SG to a Mister to a software emulator, and you run those sounds, MD Fourier automatically compares uh, the recordings, and you can see where the differences are, how certain uh, uh, sound channels differ, and how broadly they differ. And you can use that to um, kind of inform your... Uh, adjustments to making your replication more like uh, the target sound. But, you know, uh, I'm, I'm kind of sp uh, a little bit from Analog Frontiers Part 3 here, but, you know, in his interview and that, Artemio said, uh, you know, I think that uh, preservation should be blind to preferences. And... Okay perhaps more so than uh, perhaps audio more so than anything else, because the audio is, as we've said, wildly subjective, but you kind of have to take yourself out of that because it's like, well, I know everyone prefers Genesis model one sound. And of course not every single model one Genesis sounds exactly the same, but we also have, we also need to have references for what uh, all of these systems sound through the full range of what they can produce through MD Fourier. And, you know, just like I believe it was mentioned in the chat, uh, you know, in Mr. For example, uh, they have attempted to replicate <laughs> the, the sample recordings from Artemio's Genesis one and Genesis two. Uh, and you can choose which of those uh, audio profiles you want, because if you know, you, you can't just say like, oh, only the Model 1 is worth preserving. No, I mean, we need to know what what many uh, possible uh, options sounded like. I think gaming culture often tries to force everyone into having a consensus and agree. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, 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 boy, yeah. <laughs> Something. And so I feel that choice, accurate research and choice is the best way to go because it's it's an individual based decision. You know, it should it shouldn't be a decision made as a group. 
So if I like if I'm looking at the My Life and Gaming guys right now, and I'm like, guys, I'm gonna go play a game on my Genesis. I'm gonna use this right here to get my AV. Then you know, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully you guys wouldn't be traumatized by that. No, no. Um, but yeah, but it's all about it's all about choice and finding ways to, in the case of sound, use the MD Fourier project as a tool mm -hmm. to help replicate that accuracy of all these different consoles and be able to present that choice. And, and I think it is important to remember, you know, Artemio uh, consistently refers to it as a tool. Uh, you know, uh, he, he once explained it to me, you know, uh, j just, you know, it's just a tool like a hammer, you know. Uh, and certainly you could do a hammer, use a hammer to, you know, build the most beautiful house you've ever seen or, you know, a shack that, you know, is going to fall apart in two weeks, uh, you know. And I do think that there is a danger. And again, you know, with anything with preservation, you, you have to have to think beyond what you perceive yourself and uh, critically evaluate, you know, well, how was this used? Because any given project could claim, you know, we use MD Fourier for our sound adjustments. And I think mm -hmm. in many people's minds that is kind of shorthand for like, oh, well, then it's the one to get. It's it's perfect. And that's not necessarily true. It just means that they, they used it. Maybe they used it and went, huh, and then did nothing. <laughs> or, or maybe they, uh, uh, they, maybe they uh, actually did uh, make some adjustments but couldn't push it all the way. Don't assume just because MD Fourier was used. You know, if you really want to know yourself uh, how close it is, then you need to take a sample from, you know, the target that you want to hit, such as a Model 1 Genesis. I know we're talking Genesis a lot, but I, I do believe, if I'm not mistaken, that must be where the MD and MD Fourier came from, even no, though it is... it's musical doctor. It's musical oh, doctor. Well, the, the, oh, well, there you, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I always, it's just, the Mega Drive version was done first. I always assumed uh, that was what it was for. But, uh, but it is, of course, available for uh, as a tool for many platforms. But uh, if you really want to know, don't just accept as truth what someone said about, you know, their emulator or their FPGA core or, or their whatever. Uh, don't just assume like, oh, they said it was used MD Fourier, then this is, this is absolute 100% reference quality. No, you, if it is important to you, then you need to make your own analysis right. using MD Fourier, which you can download for yourself. And me, you know, who was actually kind of afraid to use it for a long time, uh, Artemio was like, you know, you, you know, yeah, I, I'm not a gatekeeper on this. Like, you don't have to send me the files. You can do it. You can run your own analysis. And I was like, mm, okay, I'll try. And I'm like, oh, this is actually kind of fun. So <laughs> you should, hey, you should absolutely do your own. Right. What's that? Let's say what? I, I didn't hear that. Oh, sorry. Try Like I was just saying, Hey, why don't we look at, some of uh, some of those analysis that you have uh, from some of the Sega Genesis consoles, if you have them available. Yeah, Corey, well, I, I have a few, made, but I, I uh, wanted to to screen a little larger once I... he has has yeah. them up. Yeah, but I, I wanted to mention uh, beforehand that it, it, MD4 just as as Tri said, is is not a, a solution for everything. It's it's just a tool. And we have many other things that we ha we need to preserve sound. We need to have uh, archives, recordings like the 16-bit preservation project, uh, or you need to have uh, the the gameplay with the sound effects in good quality with a good audio card. We need to have a lot of stuff. We need also uh, emulation. We need also simulation with FPAJ uh, open source implementations, because this is a constant process. Once you achieve something, you need to figure out how to push it through to, to the next generation of, of people that will be doing this, right? Mm -hmm. And they will need documentation, they will need open source, open source tools. That's why md 3 is open source attempting to, to do that just as, as Mystery is and as MAME is. Uh, the spirit of all this is to get those uh, th that knowledge to the next generation and documentation and at the same time it's very important to keep the hardware working because we don't know what we'll be able to pull off in like 50 years uh, in analysis terms over those things and that could be way more complete to what we have so right. this is not like a, a, a silver bullet it's it's just a tool mm -hmm. okay yeah, and, in the process and 
you know, like 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 you say, um, the I'm, I'm starting. I started to lose my train of thought. I had a good thought, but now I kind of <laughs> lost it. Um, <laughs> anyway, go on. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you were talking about um, you know making recordings of these things and using them within the Fourier. It's a really good reason for crowdsourcing to become right. a large part of this. So. Right now, as I understand it, for instance, you don't have any recordings from a Pioneer Laser Active. Is yeah. that correct? That's correct. So if somebody has a Laser Active and they would like to contribute, you can download the suite, play it via, uh, if you have the Genesis pack in, via a cartridge or the CD version, make a recording, and it can be used for analysis. And that's very helpful. And it's true of many other devices besides just the Pioneer Laser Active. Mm-hmm. Now, I think it's important to remember, too, that, uh, you know, a lot of people may think, you know, in the here and now, well, you know, I don't really care about 100 percent accuracy. But the thing is, if we don't strive for uh, compiling as absolutely accurate as possible data as we can to send forward into the future, then people will have a harder and harder time uh, approximating what, uh, what it really is, what that, uh, true accurate source really is. So, you know, accuracy is important because, uh, you know, presumably right now we are, in, you, w while we have the systems that still function, uh, we're in the best position to provide that information for the future. Yeah, that's right. I think that if if we have the capability to do something, and that something could be very difficult in the future, we have every responsibility to do it now as, as a community, right now. And uh, just as Tri said, we we have MD3 running on many systems, and we need people to to just develop on on these systems if you're capable of, or just record, uh, just like Chris said. But of course, there are some uh, limitations. You need a good uh, audio interface. We, we would love that any any interface would be good enough, but but not every interface is good enough uh, to have like uh, preservation quality recordings. But any interface is good enough to make your own measurements and compare, because that same interface will have the same flaws or or virtues uh, for any recordings that you make. So they are basically eliminated when you are comparing things. Uh, capture with the same audio interface, even though if it's not a perfect one, right? So it doesn't uh, like exclude you from from making tests. And a good audio interface is not that expensive. It they should be cheaper, but they are not that expensive <laughs> uh, nowadays. And some some capture cards, even if you're capturing an HDMI source, as I discovered, yeah. uh, like mine, for example, I can actually open it as an audio source in an audio recording program and record a WAV file, yeah. uh, which I was I was pretty pleased to see. But not every capture card offers that. It's like that HDMI source is a separate device. We also have a test to test the equipment, so you could know how uh, how good it is in, in a very stringent way because it's it's a very demanding test for audio equipment, and we have that also available if you are interested in that. And and we of course uh, measure your audio equipment before accepting uh, requ uh, submissions, right? Not that we are uh, elitists or anything. We just need mm -hmm. to to have a, a a baseline, right? Uh, there was a interesting question uh, from the chat from Chris Fratz was uh, asking, uh, here's an interesting thought on the topic of what should be preser preserved. Uh, why not try to preserve how retro consoles uh, sounded through various different setups? Like, for example, you know, a VCR to an RF or composite. I mean, know, a, that's a, like, mono, a mono TV speaker. I mean, that's what I had growing up. Yeah, of course. And and that's completely possible. The thing is how you record it, because yeah. your recording equipment is uh, the limitation. But uh, BHAs is perfectly uh, doable in, in many ways. In, a, in in And it's one of the targets of the MD3 project, because it, it, it was the documentation says that it can help you figure out if, it's, if your setup is transparent, mm -hmm. but it can be also uh, used to figure out what the audio signature in terms of equalization or transformation from the sound uh, you are getting. Like if you get an open source can converter and you plug it uh, and record through that, does it affect? Well, you can check that because right. you run your base uh, recording without the, the the hardware. 
then you run it with the open source can converter and compare those. And if they are identical, then there's no noise that the uh, open source can convert is, is is getting into it. And and that's the case. The OS SC is, is is completely transparent. And it can also be used like for comparing uh cables, audio cables, video cables, if there's uh noise from the video signal and how much it measures the noise floor and can help you compare just like 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 Chris said, the PHAs, the uh, what is it doing to the sound, right? Uh, but in terms of a, like a speaker, you'd need to have a calibrated microphone and a good setup to record that, to know what's really going on, and that you're not comparing what the microphone does to the recording, right? Well, and related to that, you know, the other night, the four of us were, were chatting, and, you know, I, I kind of brought up how, you know, I, I was not a huge arcade kid. And, of course, when I was in the arcade, it was usually very noisy. And, you know, I, I had a hard time hearing, like, the sounds of a specific game. So I don't have, like, a solid idea. You know, I don't collect arcade boards. I don't have a super gun except for my uh, Neo Geo. Um, so I don't have that solid of an idea of, like, what does, what what do arcade games sound like outside of, emulators and you know i was i was emulating some arcade games you know in the past several weeks uh to record them and i was just like you know i don't like how arcade games sound is this how they really sound (laughs) and you were telling me you know no i mean this is actually a a big problem where I, i don't think very many arcade games actually take into account the very particular types of speakers that the machines actually had. And that's why these uh, emulated arcade games often sound very kind of shrill. Yeah, yeah. or just blown out kind of at times. You you have a, I probably think you have a, the answer to that, Chris. Well, yeah. So, I mean, in addition to, if you think about the sound that these systems have, in addition to the chip, you have the, the preamplifier and all the, you know, capacitors that are involved but then you do have the speaker that's in the cabinet and then you have the cabinet itself because Mm -hmm. whenever you listen to something and you have your headphones on or you're listening to your hi-fi system or whatever that speaker enclosure itself is affecting what it sounds like and so when you have this large mdf or particle board or what have you enclosure uh that the sound is coming from that's also going to affect what you hear and therefore affect your memories of that particular arcade game. Mm-hmm. So if you were to load it up, load it up in something like MAME, you know, and they aren't doing, they just happen to not be doing filters for that, those particular sound chips and that output as well as some sort of uh, equalization, if you prefer uh, to simulate it being in an arcade cabinet, then yeah, it's not going to sound anything like it. And I, in fact, I even think for a uh, Capcom for CPS one, you know, we have, um, Street Fighter, the original Street Fighter, Chun Li is actually voiced by three different women, I think. So each one that says, like one says Yata, <laughs> and, and someone else says Spinning Bird Kick, and it's all different. But they knew that because the fidelity would not be as high when they played it back, then it was okay <laughs> to have different people voicing. Mm-hmm. But then when they moved to CPS2, the sound in increased in quality and they said well now we're going to have to redo the voices so it's oh. more consistent that's why they gave that's everybody funny. their own voices starting with super i think probably because they had to redo <laughs> everything yeah well but you know it's i mean it's you know it's interesting thinking about you know the arcade and you know obviously you want to preserve the actual unfiltered sound that is truly coming from the arcade board yeah, but but the, it would be really interesting to be able to somehow have the option to kind of replicate that for a standard like home theater setup. The thing is, uh, now that you mention it, uh, for instance, Mame's uh, objective is not to preserve whatever is outside the arcade board, right? Its objective mm. is to preserve what's inside the arcade board, and it doesn't go to the filters or to the to the simulation of the the, the equipment that you're using, mm-hmm. but. Uh, one rationale behind that is that if you plug it, MAME, straight into a preamplifier and then to an arcade speaker, you'll have to simulate it by a physical means. And we're talking about simulating via uh, virtual means, right? And, yeah. and that's good. It, it, it would be good to have an option. But it's, it's uh, one, one main target and very important target is to have it 
reproduce the sound exactly as the original hardware did. So you could have that output stage connected to anything physical and not being altered as if it were completely exchangeable. I mean, yeah. uh, if you have a Sega Genesis and have a Mister, you can swap them and you wouldn't notice the difference if they are uh, than they are. If they are uh, uh, targeting the same system and the same filters, uh, then the idea is that you don't you wouldn't notice it, right? Yeah. And but then have, I guess the yeah. the result is is more and more people uh, play. You know, as time goes on, and and yeah, there's fewer and fewer people that actually experience these games in their intended environment. People think, well, this is just how these games sounded. You know, you've got all of these mm -hmm. arcade, you know, officially released arcade collections and stuff, and people just think this is how they sounded. And it's yeah. it's not true. So you know, it's it is really a tricky matter. Yes, because the user needs to understand that as a requirement from from their side. Like I need it to be pure because I am going to connect it or plug it into an arcade uh, cabinet, or I am going to just like have it unfiltered or filtered because my home theater is a very high fidelity system. I want to have the, the, the emulation or simulation cut all those high-end or, or high high spectrum frequencies, like all the treble, because the arcade uh, cabinets use like speakers that were up to 8, eight kilohertz or 10 kilohertz, and that gives it a, a filter, a very steep filter that, that removes all the harshness that Yamaha uh, synthesis by FM, just like the Genesis, the preamplifier does that as well. And that is sometimes not preserved, right? And and we want to to have those as options and teach the 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 user which one would be uh, ideal for this their situation. And that's not something easy, right? Yeah. And for some systems, that's very subjective. Like the IBM PC in particular. Yeah. There are hundreds of sound cards for that thing, <laughs> and they all have different circuits, right? So, like, yep. if I said Doom, how are you going to preserve Doom? You know, what, which sound card are you going to select? Because if you select a Sound Blaster 16, it doesn't have the same low pass filter as the Sound Blaster Pro. So whenever you fire the machine gun and you hear da 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 with a, with a Sound Blaster 16, when you fire it on the Pro, you're going to hear more of like a <laughs> it's going to be this much more like muffled mm -hmm. sound. It's totally different, but you've got to preserve both. Yeah. yeah. And, that's, and, aware of it. and I think on top of that, oh, sorry. Go Sorry, Corey, go ahead. I was just going to say, in, when it comes down to that, it's it almost seems like insurmountable at this point. Like, there's just too much out there that I think that, you know, like, what is, is preventing from people just being like, there's no way we can do this. So Well, especially with, like, arcade stuff in particular. I mean, you know, every individual game, I mean, you're, you would have to come up with a way to run MD Fourier style tests on each board. You know, when, when it comes to Sega Genesis, uh, or NES or something like that, well, NES is kind of a complicated matter itself. And maybe that's another topic we want to talk about because of expansion audio, you know, uh, you, you can't, you cannot preserve the sound of expansion audio or get a profile test of the expansion audio without having those actual cartridges that have the expansion audio hardware. You can't run that test on an emulated uh, form without having uh, results from the real thing. And, you know, how are you going to run that test on uh, hardware that wasn't designed to run it? So you're, you know, that that's obviously, that's not something that just anyone can do. You know, that's obviously something someone who can, you know, wire into, you know, these boards very carefully as opposed to, you know, I can just use my Mega EverDrive and run MD Fourier on my uh, Sega Genesis or, you know, use my uh, Super SD System 3 to run it on, uh, you know, provided that has accurate sound output. Uh, I can run that through, you know, on my PC engine, but, you know, with, with a uh, very specialized thing where, where the, the sound comes from specialty hardware that is part of the board, like a Famicom cartridge or an arcade game like that, that, that's just a huge task that is going to be something that only a limited few people can, can actually do. Yeah. You'll have to jump into Z80 assembly and Motorola 68K assembly. Right, arcade homebrew. I mean, 
you could test it on an emulator, burn it on a ROM, and then jam it into the socket of your CPS2 board and then say, all right, let's run MD4A. And I think that, <laughs> that by putting it out there and, and making it open source, you know, getting people interested in it, you know, that's, I, th- our team, I think you told me one time that that's kind of a problem that like MAME is running into where there's just, they're running out of people who are knowledgeable and like and really feel the drive to preserve this stuff and you know just we're in a, or it, C- crt is in the same way we're just like the people that really understand this stuff you know are eventually going to die and this information needs to be passed on and and there's there needs to be interests from the from the generation that's younger right and it's not that it's not happening there's very talented individuals that that are younger and that get into this and and do amazing work and have helped in, in every sense. But yes, um, most most of this uh, old school knowledge is is for people that's uh, older than, than myself, and that's <laughs> that's a shame, right? Mm-hmm. So, do we want to take a look at some of the discoveries that you've made? Do you have some examples available? Oh, I, I have a, a few things that uh, we could show. Yeah. Um, let me. Nice. This is, for instance. Uh, the, the plot between a Model 1 and a Model 2 Sega Genesis system. And uh, what's, what's, uh, what you're seeing on screen is uh, from left to right, the x-axis is uh, frequencies. To the left, you have what we call uh, the, the low end, or what's called the low end. It's, it's frequencies closer to zero, and that's the bass, right? Like, like your bass guitar. Mm-hmm. And to, to the right, you have the treble, and, and that's the high end. Okay, as, as you go from left to right, it, you go from very uh, low frequencies to high frequencies, bass to treble, okay? The middle line is, is a zero. What you're seeing here is a difference plot. It, it, it's the, the difference between two spectrograms. It's the difference between how what Genesis sounds against the other. So, if this plot, this graph, were to be completely empty, it would be a perfect match, okay? Mm-hmm. If it would be a straight line in the middle around zero, it would be also a very, very close to perfect match because it would tell you that everything is in the same spot. Okay? What you're seeing here is some differences. And uh, those differences go up and below. That means that uh, it, we are, we are comparing against the reference system. This, the reference here is the Sega Mega, Mega Drive or Genesis Model 1. And the comparison system is a Model 2. So what you're seeing is how much the Model 2 differs against the Model 1. Okay? And all you're seeing on screen is how it differs. So you can tell that there are three colors. You have green, yellow, and and, uh, teal, aqua uh, color. Okay? A bluish one. The green one is FM. That's the Yamaha synth. The yellow and uh, and, and blue one, or, or teal one, are the PSG, SPSG the other synth from the Sega Master System that's in there. And the traces show you how the, the, the audio differs in volumes or amplitudes between them. So you can tell that on a Model 2, the FM is higher in volume against the PSG, and that they are also filtered in a different way. They have different curves that uh, tell you how they are equalized. And if you flatten those, if you were to create a filter to flatten those, you'll get... Uh, a flat line and you'd get the same sound. That's what the triple bypass, for example, does. If you insert a triple bypass into one Genesis 2, it shatters uh, or, or, or simply squashes those to be the same as a Model a model 1, BA3, okay? That's kind of, uh, of, of what you're seeing here. I don't know if you've got any questions about, about this. Uh, no, not about that in particular, but I mean, you know, the the interesting thing about how you can see like what the what uh, the levels produced by the different chips, um, you know, I don't know if you have any examples on hand uh, that were compared against uh, a, an emulator, whether that's a FPGA emulator or a software emulator. But like, uh, you know, for example, when I was working on the episode for the NT Mini Noir, and I you know, wanted to run MD Fourier tests on it, I was able to very clearly see, you know, square one, square two, triangle wave, noise channels, stuff like that. I could see these clear lines and I could see 
how far off center they were. And that gave me an idea of, okay, I need to, I could use, if I remember right, I think I was using like the triangle wave was very close to the middle, very close to zero. The others needed to come down a bit though. So, you know, this is something that not just someone who is a, you know, engineering a new emulator or some sort of, uh, preservation tools can use, you know, if you just want to tune your own emulation device that you own, uh, you can use it to get much closer to, um, to the, to the target that you're, that you're looking for, you know, like, like getting as close as possible to a real NES. Now the NT mini noir cannot get 100% there. There is a low pass filter on it that you can't do anything about, but, you can get it much closer than uh, the the defaults on the firmware. Uh, so you know it's it's something that that anyone uh, might want to consider doing when you do have that power to uh, change the levels of various sound channels. Another yeah, yeah. other things that are really cool about the MD four A project is you can compare cable quality. So different mm -hmm. RGB cable manufacturers, you can look and see what sort of uh, noise level you're getting from generally a video mm -hmm. signal interfering with audio. This is uh, this is a comparison between two cables, for example. For example. There you go. And I think it's important to remember that if you record MD Fourier from a console via analog output and then record MD Fourier again from that same console, it there are going to be differences just yeah. because of the inherent noise in analog cables. So there is a certain range where you, you can expect mm -hmm. some, some differences are normal just because of the nature of analog. And it was, wasn't it recently discovered, uh, you guys told me about this during our talk a couple of days ago that, that the SNES sounds different as it warms up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is incredible I mean, is crazy not, to me. not 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 in the way that i think ears can percept but but uh, md4 you can but, but md4 you can yeah here is a, a a graph that shows you how the frequency changes between the same super nintendo as i turn it on and let it heat to room temperature and then artificially heat it and artificially cool it down <laughs> okay and uh, as, as it was heated up and it was cooled down artificially, you'd get uh, a difference in pitch. And this is not only between a single Super Nintendo system. Every Super Nintendo system has a, uh, um, well, uh, a clock, let's say, just uh, that changes with the temperature and between uh, make. So no Super Nintendo sounds exactly the same at the exact same temperature. And it doesn't sound like itself. At different temperatures and uh, <laughs> we're not talking like a huge difference we're talking like uh in in, in music you you measure this in cents that's 100 of the frequency between one note in an octave and the next one and, and there's people that can notice this kind of difference with the, the their bare ears but then if we can tell us this and how they differ in 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 tonality and what's so funny is y'all were talking about how the actual on paper specs of the Super Nintendo, like it wouldn't actually hit those unless you were artificially cooling the system to be like zero degrees Celsius or something. <laughs> yeah, it, it never runs at the specified uh, clock speed. It, it runs it always runs a little higher. And, you know, I, I do think Super Nintendo is an interesting example because... I think Super Nintendo, most people don't think... Super Nintendo tends to be emulated subjectively pretty well in terms of uh, sound especially. Like, you know, generally when you play it on a software emulator, you play it on a on a Super NT or a Mr., you're like, yeah, 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 that sounds like a Super Nintendo. But you found a lot more differences even with that system than, than you expected. Yeah, there were a lot of differences. David, David uh, from Plog, David Bienz, made uh, uh, an excellent test. This is the test that I'm showing on the screen. It's the basic test that I, I made like a year ago, and David made an amazing test for, for the Super Nintendo that's like a stress test and goes through all the places that it, it needs to go because he uses the SPU directly instead of just like playing samples as I did. But that's the answer to, to why, uh, Cry, because 
it it runs samples and uh, they are kind of uh, more direct because you have a di already a digital sound that you know how to play and at which frequency. However, what I'm showing on screen is the curve that uh, the low pass filter in the Super Nintendo has. So it does uh, filter the sound and that's generally not uh, targeted as a part of the emulation. How how the higher frequencies mm. are uh, diminished uh, in in a real Super Nintendo system as opposed uh, to an emulator or even Toslink out uh, to reduce the, the harshness of the high frequencies either intentionally or not. But it was there, right? Hmm. We also have... Artemio, you have uh, some data about the capacitors and the turbo yes. duo. Yes. Yeah. There it I is. mean, what was was that your personal system? Yeah. This uh, this one that's on screen right now. It's a uh, one of my personal systems. It's a uh, PC Engine Duo, uh, that they are uh, notable for their failing capacitors, and you can see that it's all over the place, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the same system again it, against itself, and. Uh, what, what this plot shows is how much each one of the audio channels uh, differ when uh, when you change capacitors because this was recorded after I recapped the system and before. And what crazy. Same yeah, it is. Different capacitors, that much of a difference. And, you know, for example, your uh, childhood Sega Genesis Model 1 that you know, everyone who's used MD Fourier to try to match like Mr. Cores and stuff to, uh, you know, it, it is stock. You've never modified it in any way whatsoever. Now we assume that capacitors are not altering the audio signal, but we actually don't necessarily know. Well, we kind of know because we, we have used it interchangeably, uh, due to several reasons. One of them being that Bob from retro RGB, Bernard, and Tianfeng uh, and, and David have measured their own systems mm -hmm. and they measure basically 99.95% uh, similar to mine. Okay. So we can say that either all Sega Genesis aged <laughs> the same way mm -hmm. in, in, under very different conditions or that it hasn't been changed that much. And we have also checked that against recapped systems and the signature unless they were damaged has not changed. My particular system does have an, an inconvenience. If I, while I was developing MD for you, I noticed uh, during that uh, during summer that sometimes I would get different readings from my same <laughs> Sega Genesis. Just during and the summer. And you know what was it? <laughs> it was because my room was like at 80 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, one of the capacitors is not very good. <laughs> and uh, with the combined temperature inside the Sega Genesis after one or two hours of being on, it changes the volume of one of the channels. But <laughs> that's something that you no, can I, check. I mean, I've seen mm. something like that happen with mine where my, like the right channel on mine is just like very, very slightly lower than the left channel. Yeah. And, and, and that's the idea that you can just like check your system, uh, record it before sending it for service, mm -hmm. recording it after sending it for service mm -hmm. and check if it changed. That that would yeah. be one one use case. Another use case could be okay. I record my second Genesis. Check it against the reference that we have verified, and you you'd have to trust us. But we are putting everything out that we have, and you see that it differs. Then you can tell okay, there's something bad on my right channel on the mixing between the PSG and FM. Okay, and and you can go and and just like check that. That's what TM Feng has done uh, a lot of the times, and that's part of the the, the other use. And and in that capacitor. Uh, measurement that I showed, I also show uh, that the CD-ROM access time changed because I can measure that. And uh, it changed <sighs> after recapping the system. It changed the volume between ADPCM and PSG and the CD-ROM and how the frequencies went. So it was completely off. Okay. Artemio, so, do you want to share which systems the MD Fourier is currently under development for? Yeah, sure. It's been published uh, to the public for uh, Genesis, Sega CD, PC Engine, and PC Engine CD. It, it, it's already done, but not published for the basic NES system, but we need to make expansion audio. Pino Batch has done an amazing job at, at making those, uh, those, designing those tests. We have also unpublished audio equipment tests. That's for general audio equipment checking. We have a, a 
Super Nintendo that David Beans made and uh, is amazing. And we have I have to just like uh, match it with my old test to get uh, the whole thing because MD Freer not only measures audio, it also measures frame rate and another uh, another video parameters. And I want to match that before releasing Super Nintendo. And it's also a, a big can of worms. It's uh, being developed for Neo Geo. It's probably been, uh, uh, well, it's being developed right now for CPS-1, uh, but it's a very, very early stage. And uh, we also have uh, uh, some working prototypes for Commodore 64, but it's, it's that's that's uh, very deep waters to, <laughs> to go into. Oh gosh, the SID chip, that would be, that'd be yeah. interesting. Yeah, you know, I, I, I have up. a I have a question that I've actually kind of wondered about for a while, you know, regarding like Sega CD and TurboGrafx CD. You know, I think normally we think of and, and, you know, I have to confess to not being all that familiar with the Sega CD uh, personally. Uh, I think we normally think of, you know, Sega CD is mixing audio from the Sega Genesis with streamed audio from the Sega CD. When you're, when, you know, we know that flash cartridges like Mega SD and Mega EverDrive Pro have used um, MD Fourier to, to some extent to, uh, you know, attempt to, to hit uh, more accurate targets. Um but is it just about balancing the volume of the streamed audio with the console audio, or is there more to the characteristics of uh, th those CD audio systems that I'm kind of just not thinking about? There's, there's more detail, like how do they do fade out, for example? That was uh, an issue that, that showed in, in one of those cards. Mm. And uh, you have to mimic that, right? Because otherwise it, it won't work. How they sync the audio when you're playing it back and how they respond to to the commands. Because it's it's like a different part of the system. And uh, of course you also have the filtering, not also the balance, but the filtering. In terms of CD audio, you expect them to be uh, non-different in frequency information as uh, FM or, or mm. PSG or samples are, but they could differ. And that would mean that there's some processing being done aside from uh, the, the frequency response or, or the equalization. You also have aliasing that, that could be done uh, or present due to filtering or conversion between sample rates. And that's a huge issue that that uh, Risha addressed uh, for, for Mr. Uh, with sent in uh, six and, and, and Sultan, they they made amazing work on that, and they also implemented filters uh, that could be system wide for for Mister. And uh, resampling is an issue that uh, that brings up aliasing, which brings up a lot of artifacts on sound and CD sound, because CD sound runs at 44 kilohertz, and you usually emulate at 48 kilohertz, and you have to find a multiple of that <laughs> to work uh, towards the higher end, and then go back to whatever the user is, is, is outputting, and that that is difficult. You know, I, I don't I don't know why, but you know, just talking about these CD systems kind of made me just think, and you know, I, this is this is beyond MD Fourier, right? At least at the moment. Uh, but you know, there's the whole thing about the PlayStation One with the, you know the RCA jack units. You know, everyone talks about ooh, it had the measured. that's it measured. had it, it has been measured. And, I heard something not that long ago that is is it just is it totally placebo is it is that not even true or or is is there something to it? Well, you could use MD Fourier right now and use the audio equipment test and play just a CD version okay. of that test and check out by yourself if that <laughs> is true or it is. Hmm. <laughs> I, I thought I thought that uh, I thought that tests not using the actual MD Fourier. Uh, sound playback from like the 240p test suite you know using those actual doop, 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 doop sounds i thought i thought you know I, i've asked you about about in the past like oh could i just record two versions of the same music and i, I was under the impression that was in theory you could do it but was not officially like sanctioned yet <laughs> yeah no it's it's not officially supported and it's in there but it's not uh it, it won't ever be public because uh the precision of them before is it's it's very dependent on syncing the signals and having a very precise alignment between the audio signals but the audio equipment test runs on any audio playback system if you I have a, a wave a, a play a way to play a flak 
or a wave file, uh, then you you can measure that equipment. And that way is the way I was proposing. You could check because you burn a CD with a, an audio track that's specifically designed for testing audio at forty four kilohertz. Oh, okay. And that we have, and then you just compare that the original that the digital image that we have against your recording, and you'll get the differences that that PlayStation makes on that audio file as a CD player because there's more work to do uh, against the XA audio, the synthesizer, everything inside a PlayStation. Mm. But yeah, that's within the scope of what we plan to do. But uh, although a friend of mine, a, a very different friend of mine is working on that, it's mm. it's way into the future. <laughs> it's a lot, of <laughs> a lot of work. Any help is, is, is of course, welcome. This is <laughs> not like gatekeeping, just like you said. <laughs> do you have a call for any developers in particular, uh, to develop in a certain assembly language or C or what have you for a specific machine, a lot of yeah. Japanese PCs, for instance. Uh, anybody who has interest in in there is is pretty welcome. We we need any help that uh, the you can share. David is is very capable of, of doing a lot of stuff. Bino Batch is is awesome at developing uh, many of these uh, things. But we need more help. We need to develop for the Sega Master System. We need to develop for every arcade board out there. <laughs> So CAD yeah. is, is a pretty big target. As you can see, this is a program in the C, C, C80 uh, CPU book. And that's what I'm trying to get into, a new Geo. And Ooh. that would open uh, against uh, what, what uh, another friend is making for CPS1. And uh, try to help us out and, and, and work our way to, to have this running on everywhere as, as much system as possible. I'd love to have it in X68000, PC88, PCFX. Uh, N64, and uh, there's a lot of stuff. Also, running on Dreamcast or, or or GameCube, those are targets that the 240p test suite already has. But there's the issue of frame buffers, syncing, a lot of mm. things that need to be figured out because I'm not an expert. I'm I'm, I'm learning as I go. David from Plug has been a, an amazing guide, as well as Pinovac and Tianfeng and, and Bob from RetroRGB and Bernard to guide me through what is going on and, and what I'm doing because... This project uh, was was built around uh, uh, just a requirement that we had uh, together with my life in gaming about analyzing a system audio, and uh, I, I I had coded um, a tool to assist me at home whenever somebody rang the bell. I wanted it to be notified to my phone, so I used <laughs> a Raspberry Pi, uh, making a Fourier transform every every five seconds and recognize that sound and send me a signal to my phone whenever that happened and <laughs> i had that in, in my desktop and already made and, and we wanted to analyze sound i just put two and two together and, and made it right <laughs> but so so i'm i'm just learning as i go where should people go to find out more about the md4a project right now uh the junkrhq.net uh, has a uh, a site a mini site that has md4a with all the documentation and uh, you can contact me by any of the means available there. And if you want to go into the, the development, there's a Discord for it mm -hmm. uh, where we develop this, right? Or, or it's, it's pretty open in general. All right. Do you guys have anything else to add, chat? Do you have any uh, questions for us? We're a little over now, but... <laughs> yeah, I see, I see a couple of people said they already had to, had to head on out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not seeing anything. So it's, it sounds it sounds like the people who came in late. Apparently, this is a problem they had all day. Where the people who came in late, uh, for some reason, the video wouldn't load. But the uh, the videos are going to be available uh, on demand uh, through the duration of um, the the uplink event. I, I I believe is what I saw mm -hmm. uh, the organizers posting in the chat. All right. Well, I guess we'll officially sign off. So mm -hmm. thanks, everyone, for coming to the panel, talking about sound. Thank you guys uh, for joining me. And uh, see you around the net. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, right. everybody, Thank for, you, uh, for for checking us out. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, thanks Enjoy for having us. Enjoy the rest of Vump Leak. Uh, yeah. Thanks for having us on the panel, Chris. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah. Certainly. Anytime. <laughs> All right. Uh, take care, everybody.